You guys want to each start? Just give a brief introduction who you are and what you do. Sure. Yaorana, hello everyone. Um, my name is Tituan Bernicott. I am the founder of Coral Gardeners. I'm based in French Polynesia, South Pacific Ocean, on the, on the sister island of Tahiti. I'm here today for my first World Ocean Week in New York with my ocean sister Sylvia and a lot of amazing ocean friends uh, to talk about the, the coral reef here. And can we maybe just acknowledge that you spoke at the UN earlier today? It was a great experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amber? I'm Amber Sparks. I'm co-founder of Blue Latitudes. We are a marine environmental consulting firm that works repurposing offshore oil and gas platforms into artificial reefs. And my other half is right here. And I'm Emily Hazelwood. I'm the other half of Blue Latitudes, and we're really excited to be here to be speaking with you. Nice. Well, so, I mean, there's so many directions to go here, but I guess the, the first thing is just to go deeper into the organizations that you each founded. So Coral Gardeners is slightly obvious from the name, but what exactly do you guys do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we, we are the gardeners of the ocean. Well, I started the organization uh, about six years ago. Our mission is to help revolutionize ocean conservation and create that global movement to help save coral reef ecosystems. So we focus on different areas of, of action, such as uh, gardening corals, like planting corals. We, we call it ecosystem restoration. We do also um, a lot of awareness telling the story of the reef. And um, this goes like with the local community empowerment. We, we bring a lot of people, fishermen, island kids in the water to plant their corals and, and reconnect with their heritage. But also we have that new part of the work we do, which is the innovation, technology and science with the Coral Gardeners Labs, where we are finding some new technologies, new solutions to better understand how the ecosystem works so, so we can better protect them here. Yeah. So we'll go deeper into what exactly that all means in a minute, but what, uh, what does Blue Latitudes do? So we started Blue Latitudes because we recognized a problem. In all of the oceans, there are offshore oil and gas platforms, hundreds of them. And at some point, each of these are going to be removed. Now, that seems like it would be a simple solution. But at the same time, below most of these offshore oil and gas platforms are some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. And so we started Blue Latitudes to address this problem. How can we preserve these marine ecosystems on these offshore oil and gas platforms in a way that would be sustainable and a way that wouldn't impact the environment negatively? And so that's where we come in as consultants to evaluate and conduct assessments on these offshore oil and gas platforms to better understand their ecological value and their worth. When you say that these ecosystems are found below oil rigs, you mean directly on the legs of the oil rig, right? Exactly. Yeah. Below every single oil and black gas platform, it's like the first time you go diving on an oil platform, you almost need to do a double take. You want to look above the surface at the platform and then look below the surface again because you would not believe that every single beam and cross beam is covered in marine life. Yeah, it's hard to really wrap your head around because when you see it from above, you think you know, like a blight upon the sea or heavy industry and, you know, what must that be doing to the sea? But so you're saying when you go below the surface that it's teeming with life. Exactly. Is that kind of crazy? It's incredibly unexpected. And I think that is what gives us a lot of power and a place with Blue Latitudes. We were speaking earlier and I was saying, you know, we're not save the whales, we're save the oil platforms. And it's just kind of an interesting space to be in. Which is really harder for people to get behind. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it, does, it doesn't necessarily go down as well. But those ecosystems are valuable. And there's been a lot of studies done in California most recently that's found that they're some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. So removing these platforms would be a significant loss. And so, so how did you guys each come to start your organizations, especially so young? Like, did you guys personally see changes in the ocean or what inspired you to try to tackle these challenging issues in the ocean? I was first exposed to the Rigs to Reefs program, actually, when I graduated from college. I had an opportunity to go work on the BP oil spill as a field tech. And that was the first time I'd ever seen an offshore oil and gas platform. And that was the first time I'd ever been confronted by the devastation that can be wrought by one of these massive structures. But what was interesting during that time is that we worked with a lot of fishermen and they would be driving our sampling boats around the Gulf. And we'd be out there with them and they'd say, I can't wait to go fishing on these platforms this weekend. And at the time that seemed bizarre. I had no idea that these platforms could also support fish populations that people wanted to eat. And so that was the first time I learned that in the Gulf, they were turning these oil platforms into reefs. 
And when I moved to California to go to graduate school and I met Amber, she shared with me, California also has oil platforms, except they weren't turning them into reefs. And that's when we realized there was a problem. It's, yeah, it's really my dream job. I feel so lucky to be able to do this and to work with such a fascinating ecosystem. You know, they are the core reef. They are so complex. They are so uh, full of life and things we don't know. You know, like they are the future for medicine. They are, they are live on our planet. We don't know enough about them. So the day I discovered what they were, because growing up in, in Tahiti, we think it's just like the plants, you know, they are really our garden. We don't get to understand that they are living organisms and they are maybe the, the thing giving us everything we need in our life. In, in Tahiti, um, for my friends, my family and I, uh, they, they give us uh, the best moments when we surf the coral reef waves. The swell arrives to the reef, the reef sculpt the wave we surf, and that's the biggest smiles on our faces. And they also protect our shores from big erosion. So naturally, when I was 16 years old, and I observed my first coral bleaching event, and I discovered that this will have tremendous impact uh, on the life in our ocean and then our life. I wanted to do something. But at that time, there was not a lot of options for young people not willing to do eight years of studies to start acting for them. So we needed to get creative. Yeah, yeah we keep going. I'm actually, then what happened? <laughs> like... After um, I just played in my garden. Uh, after school, sometime during school, and I was uh, out there in the water, just trying to understand how the reef ecosystem works, how the different species of corals, they work, trial and narrow, I think you, you say in English, and just uh, getting to understand how we can collaborate with nature to create new habitats for the fish, same as the artificial reef, and then bam, does it itself. And so uh, I really like the process of being uh, in the garden and working with the fish and the corals. So I told my buddies, guys, maybe maybe we should invest more time in it. Maybe we should work hard and, and create a, a new job because uh, they are gardeners on land. And now the ocean, the coral reef, they need some support. They need some help. So maybe tomorrow, if you believe in, in my crazy vision, we you are going to be a gardeners planting corals next to your favorite surf break and maybe soon around the world and we'll be the guardians of the reef. And at the beginning they were like, but like, how can we do that? We were just a bunch of school dropouts, surfers, fishermen, and, and then we met the right people. And we work. I never worked that much since the day I left school. And I have no regrets. That was the best decision of my life. And today to have the opportunity to work with scientists, engineers, experts, it's a dream. For us as island kids, we don't get to have those opportunities. And now to be talking on the big stage about the ocean, it's, it means a lot, yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned sort of collaborating with nature, giving nature the opportunity to grow back, given, given a little bit of help. Can you guys each talk about how you collaborate with local communities with this work? Like, how do you work with the people involved, the, you know, local communities, the fishermen, whoever actually uses the, the sea there, who lives there? Well, when we're looking at repurposing an oil platform into a permanent artificial reef, you have to think about the fishermen and the divers that are going out there and utilizing that resource. And so we'll engage with those communities to understand what they value and what they're interested in seeing stay versus be completely removed from the ocean. So that's kind of, that's our connection. And what we found is that a lot of fishermen are really excited about these structures. Like Emily mentioned, they'll go out on their weekends and that's where they're fishing and that's where they're having fun with their families or divers who are looking for a thrill, a dive that's truly unlike anything else. Imagine the scaffolding of the Empire State Building. That's what it's like being on one of these platforms, except it's just all the beams and cross beams, and they're all covered in life. In California, we see scallops and enemies, schools of Jack Mackerel, even our state saltwater fish, the Garibaldi, that Nessa make its permanent home there. It's truly a, a incredible and beautiful environment. And so that draws in the community and connects us with them in the work we do. And, and Tijuan? Yeah, I mean... This is the, the center of our work, you know. The people who spend a lot of time in the water, they know so much. 
You know, you have fishermen, they spend almost every day, 50 years fishing in the water. So they saw a lot of things. And also they understand that more corals, healthier reef, more fish. And so it's simple. And I think it's, it's the key to have those people who rely on the reef, to involve them at the beginning. And in, in French Polynesia, this is a really particularity for coral gardeners because it's maybe one of the only projects which was started by the island kids. <laughs> I like to say the same one who were running naked in the neighborhood and surfing, fishing. They, they are the one who started the movement. So we have a dialogue with the fishermen, which is different. They, they consider us as their voice and they want to do something. They are also sometimes a little bit lost what to do. So I think as we grow um, and, and try to help more reef around the world, it's so important that we keep this DNA and stay true to who we are. And we go and help give opportunity, be a force of that new blue economy, avoid that parachute science and really bring the ocean people at, at the heart of the actions. Yeah. Mm. Can, can you guys each talk about any of your favorite sort of success stories from the work that you do? I mean, because actually one of the things that I really love about hosting Planet Visionaries is that everyone I talk to is involved in in things that work, you know, basically involved in solutions, like uh, c contributing positively to the world. And it's it's always uplifting to hear, you know, like good ideas that actually work and can be implemented. And so, you know, what are the things that stick with you from the, the work that you guys have done so far? Oh, you know, I, I think for a lot of the work that we do, it's when you see it off the cuff, it's people are usually anti-oil and gas and anti-rigs to reefs. And I think that can be really short-sighted because you're only looking at one side of the problem. If people want to see these oil platforms removed. And so what is very gratifying for Amber and myself is when we do a lecture and we take people diving with us and they see the marine life and they see the science behind why these reefs are growing on oil platforms to change a mind. So to anytime we give a lecture and you come away with someone saying, I had no idea there was reefs on oil platforms or I had no idea that maybe we should come up with a different solution than totally removing them. To me, that's a success story. And to me, that feels good to change someone's mind and change someone's perspective about how to think about creative ocean management. Yeah, changing the perspective as to what constitutes habitat. Exactly. Like, like where can nature live? Exactly, totally. And we can point to specific success stories. In the Gulf of Mexico, they've reefed over 500 platforms and one structure that we dove on off 200 miles offshore in the right outside the flower garden banks, they actually expanded the sanctuary boundaries to include this platform because it had so much life and was such an integral part of that unique national monument. And what also really inspires us is seeing this idea start to really take root and grow in other areas around the world, places like Malaysia and Thailand are just reefing their first structures and working after years of working hand in hand with the community, which we were just talking about is essential. And so it's really exciting and gratifying to see it take that route and, and hopefully grow into something that can be really sustainable and successful. Were you just saying that they expanded the, the dimensions of the protected area to include the an oil platform. Yeah, an oil platform. Yeah. It's very yeah. counterintuitive. It is. Like that is. I know. That's why I was like, that's that's a success right there. Yeah, that's interesting. On on my side, I think uh, one success story that I am proud is um, is to see uh, some of my team members, like um, it's like my big brother Maurite. We grew up together, and he did a two years degree, but he didn't find a job. He was coming from a family of fishermen. We grew up in Teme in the same neighborhood. He was always fixing the speaker, you know, with his hand, like the sound system or the, the bicycle, everything he was so good with his hand. And today he's working with amazing engineers who are coming from the MIT, SpaceX. To see him collaborating with those big scientists and engineers, my, my buddy from the neighborhood, I think I like this, yeah. <laughs> Didoin, can you explain the, the partnership and the support that Coral Gardeners has gotten from Rolex? For sure. We joined the, the Perpetual Planet Initiative. It's our biggest uh, support so far. And for us, what I love about this is that they want to see you succeed. Like it's accompanying us, it's advising us, and it's also giving 
more exposure to the work that we do, you know, <laughs> especially when you're lost in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. So uh, no, I think it's, it's so important to choose the, the right ally for this mission. And uh, yeah, happy to have them as, as the partners, yeah. Yeah, actually, that raises an interesting question for both of you guys. How that global reach affects your work? Like how much of what you do is about sort of public outreach and, and helping people to understand, uh, you know, the work that you do? And I mean, can you kind of talk about that? Like the, the tension between actually doing the work and then explaining the work to others so that people understand the value of the work and, and that others actually care about protecting the ocean? Yeah, we, we actually had to start a whole nother company just to address that one question. So we have our for-profit company that works in a consulting effort, works with offshore oil and gas companies to assess their oil platforms as reefs. And then in 2018, we formed the Blue Latitudes Foundation that works specifically on outreach, education, research, understanding the value of these structures and going out and communicating that value and talking to groups about what ocean conservation could look like from a non-traditional lens. You know, I think it's simple. Today, we don't have enough people who know about what's going on with the ocean and coral reef. And that's maybe the biggest problem is that if we had way more people who were connected or were aware about what our oceans are, are facing, maybe it will be another story for this World Ocean Week 2023. But the problem is that not enough people are aware and they feel connected to the ocean, half of the oxygen we breathe. So I think it's as much important or maybe more to communicate about the work that you do than doing it on the field. I think it's a great opportunity to inspire more people to start the project, to join projects, to support initiatives around the world. So at Coral Gardeners, we took this really um, seriously. First, because uh, at the beginning, we had no credibility. <laughs> We're just a bunch of surfers, fishermen, and there was no way we could get some governmental funding or grants. So we needed to show the world what we were doing and hoping people will, will support us. And so then uh, we started using the power of photography, videography, storytelling, and we start seeing that today with our modern day tools like the internet, we can reach the world and people, they can see what we are doing on a daily basis from all around the planet. So we had some really successful uh, campaign while I, I was directing a, a creative campaign in 2019 with a friend of mine called Alexi Ren and I was thinking about this little video to explain what is going on with the core reef and the video blew up. We posted and it's 78 million views on one post. It's in the top five of the most viewed video ever of the Instagram platform. And in just 10 days, we gained half a million people following our work. And that's where I understood that even from our tiny uh, headquarter, we, we can reach the world and we need to. Yeah, That's amazing. My wow, you're a real ocean influencer. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. On the one hand, those sounds like really big numbers, but then actually, if you consider the proportion of humanity that lives on the coast and it actually is directly affected by the ocean, I mean, we're currently what a couple miles from the, from the ocean. You know, it's like most of most humans are directly affected by the sea, and so when you think of it in those terms, you're like, oh, actually, those numbers aren't that aren't that crazy. Like, it makes sense that people should be caring about the the fate of the ocean. I mean, do you guys have? Anything to, to add on that front, like how you try to connect with, with the next generation, how you inspire people to, to care about the ocean? Visuals are such a powerful tool. And that Sylvia has a great quote, with knowing comes caring, and with caring there can be hope for the future of our oceans. And how do you know anything unless you can see it? You know, seeing is believing. You know, it's really difficult to go into a room and say, I want to save an oil platform because you know, nobody would believe you. You have to take someone diving. You have to show them through videos and photos how amazing and productive these reefs are. It doesn't mean that they're any less important. It means they're incredibly important. And I think for us, it's a story of hope in, in a weird way because, you know, we're all responsible for these oil platforms. And it's a nice silver lining that, you know, because they've been left alone, because you can't really do commercial fishing on them, because they're in blue ocean settings away from the coastlines, away from erosion and runoff, they can turn into productive reefs. They've been left alone. And I think that can resonate with people. I think people like to learn that the ocean is powerful and resilient if given a chance. While we're talking about sort of inspiring, inspiring hope, I mean, 
I totally agree with you that having positive stories, and I saw you were agreeing as well, Tijuan, like it's knowing that there's, that the ocean can heal itself if given the time and space and the opportunity. It, it is incredibly hopeful. So what are your hopes for, for your respective organizations? Like, what do you hope that Blue Latitudes and, and Coral Gardeners will, will achieve moving into the future? My greatest hope with Blue Latitudes and the work that we're doing with the Rigs to Reefs program is to expand beyond just oil platforms. You know, the reality is we're going to continue to use our oceans for energy production, for food production, for transportation. And even though oil and gas, it may be on its way out, but offshore wind is quickly becoming it's actually the fastest growing offshore energy industry in the world. So that's what's going to replace these oil platforms, offshore wind turbines. So if we can get people to think differently about these wind turbines, think about them as possible reef spots, to me, that's going to be an incredible area of success. And that's where we're really hoping to move into is expanding into other sectors of offshore um, energy and the wind sector in particular. I mean, does it even have to be offshore energy? It's really just any human interface with the ocean, right? Any exactly. kind of like man-made structures can also be potential havens for nature. I mean, is that kind of the broader idea? Yeah, you know, our, our mission is we want to seek out areas of our oceans where industry and the environment have intersected, but rather than have a negative impact, they've had a positive one. And we want to understand why. Why is that and how can we replicate that across other areas of our oceans to make from those more sustainable use cases of our ocean to acknowledge that we will continue using our oceans, but there's a way to do so that's sustainable and more of a win-win result. Though while very carefully not trying to promote industry in the oceans. Exactly. Right, I would assume. Exactly, <laughs> like, yeah. That's, I mean, that's kind of the tension, right? Exactly. You're trying to promote win-win scenarios, but not trying to promote more oil construction or development in the sea. No, it's a good point. It is a fine line. It's something we do want to think about. You know, we're, we're, you're never going to catch Amber or I promoting saying, let's keep drilling or, you know, anything like that. But it's more about taking um, a reality check about how we use our resources and how we can do so sustainably. Mm -hmm. Do you have something to add? Yeah, well, to come back on that point of inspiring more people to, to learn about the ocean, I think we need to make that conservation something irresistible, I think you, you say in English, something that people, they, they want to be a part of. So when you think about it, like I think after football, the museums are the second place where most of the people, they gather. And I think we should use really the power of, of collaboration, art. We need to create emotion in people uh, with the ocean. When you have a grandfather going with his grandson uh, or granddaughter to a museum to see a beautiful exhibition about the coral reef of the ocean, there will be a moment. There will be that, that emotion. And that's what we need to try to create those, those experiences where people, even if they are not diving with them, they are going to connect. The ambition we have with coral gardeners is, is huge. Yeah. We have a lot of work ahead of us. It's in terms of uh, reaching more people. I would love that every, every, everyone on this planet who knows what, what the coral is, how important the oceans are. And I would also really love to use that coral gardening. It's so tangible, the action. And I think that's how we're going to get people. They plant their own coral and they, they feel attached to their coral. So now it's about, yeah, taking action, creating hub spot, marine protected areas, restoring the damaged reef and trying to reduce our global warming. Because if this continues like this to rise, biodiversity, life, us, we're gone. So um, we need now uh, plans, action, and, and to work hard. Yeah. Yeah, so, so on that note, what does the Perpetual Planet Initiative mean to you guys? In a time of climate change, in a time of, of rapidly changing environmental impacts, like what, what is the Perpetual Planet? What first comes to mind for me is what are we leaving behind for our children and our children's children? What kind of legacy are we leaving for them for conservation and ways of working with the environment to preserve, protect, or even utilize it in a sustainable way? And so being a part of that is trying to offer those solutions and connect with them through the community, get people involved and engaged. I love that, like you're talking about getting, working with communities from a, when they're young or just enjoying the ocean as a place of fun and a place where they, they go with their friends. How can you 
take advantage of those moments to really inspire future generations to preserve and protect the oceans. Uh, no, I, I have to agree with Amber. I, I have a daughter now and I think about the amazing places that I've had the opportunity to see and dive and experience. And we were just chatting about, I'd, I'd been to Rangiro and Fakrava and how special those places are. And I think to myself, I hope those are around when she can visit. And that's powerful when you think about they might not be. That's like something that's become part of the dialogue these days. And I think when I think of Perpetual Planet, I think of maintaining those resources so that they can be around for her generation, for generations beyond her, so that she can experience those incredible places in a way that's healthy and see how healthy and beautiful our reefs and our oceans can truly be. Yeah, I think Perpetual Planet, it's the ultimate goal. Because it means that our planet will continue to live, that life is is going to still be found on this planet, so the temperature can be regulated, the oxygen that we all breathe. So I think I, I really like those two words. For me, they are the ultimate goal. Um, right now, we're trying to reinvent the relationship that uh, humanity, us as human, we have with the ocean, how we connect. So I agree with you. Um, Amber, that um, we need more kids to experience the the joy, the happiness when you are playing with fish, waves, free diving, or just na nature in general. Because when you like your playground, you want to keep it alive. And so, yeah, I think Perpetual Planet is is a, a good direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what advice would you guys each give to the average person as to how they could help keep the planet perpetual? I always want to encourage anybody that we're speaking to, different school groups, things like that, to have them look at their own unique, special talents, whether that be they're really great at writing or at photography, or maybe they love organizing groups of people to do some sort of beach cleanup or something like that. Whatever their unique gifts are, to really use those towards a conservation goal. Because when you tap into that and everybody is using their own unique gift, then we can kind of come together and from every angle, find ways to connect with our oceans and ultimately preserve them. Actually, I'll just throw myself out there as a very unusual example of exactly what you're describing, because my only, the only thing I'm good at is climbing big walls, which is really an unusual path to go down. It's a special and yet, gift. And yet here I am hosting a podcast about, about ocean conservation, <laughs> about environmental work more broadly. And, and I actually started a foundation that supports solar projects abroad and basically works in the same kind of environmental space. And, and it is a good example that no matter what the weird thing that you personally are called to do, it can potentially be used for something positive in the world. You know, it's like you never quite know where, where the path is going to take you, but it's like if you're really passionate about something and, and, you're, and you follow whatever your gift is, like you never really know like how, how it can wind up being useful. But back to what do you guys think about how the, the average person can help keep the planet perpetual? I think one of the most powerful gifts that anyone can have is to stay curious. You know, when you're a little kid, you're fascinated by everything. You want to ask why about everything and you want to learn about everything. And then you get to be an adult and you stop thinking about the world. You start thinking about your own silo and you start thinking about your own path. And I think if you can maintain and stay curious about the world to ask questions about the world, to want to explore the world, that means that you will care about the world and you will maintain, want to maintain that planet the way it is. So I think if people could stay more curious and ask questions about the world, about why things are the way they are, that can be an incredible conservation tool. I think today it's clear that we are all connected to the ocean. <laughs> with wherever we are on the planet, whether we are on your biggest wall or at the bottom of the sea, we all connected to the ocean. And I think we need more people, yeah, like you say, to connect with it, to learn about it, to spread the world. This is something easy to do, to tell those stories about the ocean and to educate more people. And then it's about also reducing our own carbon footprint. It's not easy to do. Um, it's the way we eat, the way we move. I stopped eating the red meat uh, three years and a half ago because I understood it was the first reason why the temperature of the water was was rising. And I still have so much progress to to do, but it's little daily changes and also supporting innovation. When there is something new happening, like electrical cars, things, we need to support those innovations because we are not going to be able to change everyone. 
we can't change everyone, so we need to find new ways to, to live. We need to find new ways to power our daily life using renewable energies, new way to move, to eat. So we need to support those people that they are coming with innovation and to motivate them. So, but I'm confident because the new generation, a lot of them have, they have crazy ideas and they want to do uh, something revolutionary. And that's the only way we're going to stabilize the global warming, climate change, and that will maybe still have life on our planet and maybe us. Yeah. Well, I think with that, we're going to open it up for audience q and I think there is a microphone floating around or there will be. Uh, if anyone has any questions, does anyone? Yeah, here's here's one in the front. Hi, um, thank you all for your words and your work. Uh, I was just curious about what the next level might look like for each of you and each of your organizations, and what you think you need to get there. More coral, obviously. <laughs> so much coral. <laughs> I agree. I like this. One million, the goal for 2025. Oh. <laughs> it's a lot of work, but it's feasible. Uh, you want to answer first? We are actually working on a really exciting modeling tool that is going to help us make predictions about which platforms or offshore wind farms could be good candidates for artificial reefs, because it's very time consuming to survey one reef or one oil platform, especially when you consider there are thousands. So this is something that we're really excited about that we've been gathering the information and the data for. And this is something that we're very excited about that we think is going to take things to the next level to start bringing this to be a more international program. Yeah, currently, is the program just off the coast of the U.S.? Currently, we see offshore oil and gas platforms being converted into reefs in the Gulf of Mexico, in Malaysia, and in Thailand. But hopefully that will be changing soon, especially with this tool. We're calling it Fishlet. Wait, but so back to the, the rest of that question for Tijuan, what, what's the next level for your organization? You said a million corals, but what does that mean, a million corals? More corals. Yeah. <laughs> well, it means a million, but, but does that mean planting a million individual corals? Coral reef restoration right, right now, the, the issue is that it's, it has not scale. You know, you have a lot of groups around the world, they, most of the groups are struggling with funding, not to have one employee, so it's just a couple hundred corals being planted, so everything needs to be done. And so the goal is, is to have long-term projects. So you have enough uh, long-term uh, monitoring and data set. That's what is missing for the field of restoration at the moment. It's also new methodology, really focusing on climate change, more resilient corals. To put coral gardens to the, to the next level, we, we need to focus on, on reducing the cost and the time to produce coral fragments. And to scale this around the world, we are opening uh, in the next couple of weeks in Fiji and Thailand. We're going to have uh, amazing locals there planting the corals. I would love this to become a, a new movement, a new, a new job of that blue economy where you have champions, guardians of the reef, gardeners around the planet planting uh, and reaching that first million of corals. You know, we have people on, on land, they plant a, a billion tree. Why can't we plant a million coral? And right now it's such at a small scale and, and also having just more people knowing about the reef, but, uh, and then it's the technology and innovation. Here, a question in the front, uh, Sylvia. I have a question for each of these topics. Um, for you, Tashwan, a coral reef is more than coral, as you well know. What are you doing to think about restoring other aspects that are also depleted, like the parrotfish, the groupers, the crustaceans. That's one. We hold that thought. <laughs> and for this rocking team here, <laughs> many of the rigs are much deeper than divers can go. Are you using equipment to explore down below where you can take yourselves? There's, I mean, each of these rigs is, it does provide like a vertical transect from the surface down to as deep as they might be standing, sometimes in a hundred feet, sometimes deeper. But they're like built-in laboratories. Scientists would wish to have a vertical transect to see what impact light has and current and a lot of things, but here they are ready-made. And to what extent are you finding the opportunities to go deep and you 
do you see that <laughs> as a as a future endeavor to look at these deep water systems that are right there connected to what you where you focus your time and and again <laughs> Carl Reef is not just Carl it's a metropolis it's a it's our underwater cities i think ocean sister it's a, it's a good uh, good question uh, we already talked about it and a coral reef it's the most biodiverse ecosystem on the planet like the the coral triangle close to Raja Ampat i never been but i I love to visit one day. It's the biggest hotspot of biodiversity on, on our blue planet. So it's not just the corals. They are the base, the habitat for the smaller uh, fish, but it's, it's the sea urchin, the stars, the clams, the moray eel, the sharks at the top. And, uh, and so what I can tell you is that uh, I will never get bored <laughs> because after planting the coral right now, I really want my team and I to focus on really doing it well with the corals, the building species, the base of the food chain and the ecosystem. And then I, I'm already thinking about uh, growing farming clams. They are sharing the same zooxanthellae or maybe sea urchin or why not fish. So that's why I'm saying I will never get bored because uh, there is so much to, to learn about the, the core if it's, it's so complex. And we, I'm sure we have so many more species to discover and learn how to work with them. So it's planned, <laughs> step by step, but one day, yeah, I will take you to, to farm and plant clams, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I come? Yeah, please. Let's go, adopt a clam. <laughs> <laughs> For our work, I wish I could say that I put on a wetsuit every day and got to go diving on these structures, but that's not the reality. Most of the time we're using remotely operated vehicles or ROVs to look at these platforms from sea floor all the way to sea surface. And the deep sea is perhaps my favorite environment. You're in an area that's dark, no light, high pressures, cold water, and there is incredible life that can be found at these steps. It's so different from what you're gonna find on these tropical I coral bet, reefs. Yeah. And in some cases, People don't understand it. They don't want to study it because it's, number one, not as accessible, but also not as colorful or vibrant. But our deep seas hold some of the most important secrets for medicine. And they're also some of the most biodiverse areas, more biodiverse than what we find in our shallower water reefs. And so understanding them is just the first step. Unfortunately, because they're difficult to access, there's not that much research or understanding around them. So we're very grateful that in the work that we do, we get to go down and look at these ecosystems and begin to study them, begin to understand them. And recently in the Gulf of Mexico, we were looking at a structure in about 7,000 feet water depth that was covered in this coral called Lophelia. And it's a rare coral that's protected in many areas. And here it was on a subsea template, no a way. little piece of equipment that's associated with oil and gas that normally would just be ripped out, but it's covered in this protected coral. And we were able to do an environmental survey, quantify that and really present it to the regulators to get it to be left in place once the decommissioning had been complete and preserve those corals in that one little little bit of the deep sea, which that's the last part of my uh, spiel here is that the deep sea is the majority of our oceans and we really don't know much about it yet. So I hope that I have more opportunities to explore it. Well, that's a perfect conclusion for us here Though we'll all be hanging out after. So feel free to chat with us all. But I uh, just want to say a big thank you for everybody for coming. It's a real pleasure getting to chat with you guys. And if anybody's interested in any of these other Planet Visionary podcasts, you can find any of them, including season one, episode one with Sylvia Earle, anywhere you get your podcasts and enjoy. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.